Welcome to the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Danny Kennedy, and I'm here to help you become the very best version of yourself. What is up, legends? Welcome back to the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast. And today we're joined by absolute just radio audio royalty, just a... a, a Byron Cook, welcome yeah. to the show, mate. You have overcooked that intro massively. I put a lot. Um, nah, it was I easy. do my best. I do my best. Yeah. <laughs> now, guys, so I was uh, I was fortunate enough to to meet Byron. What was it? Just pre Christmas, I reckon, not that long ago. We had a few mutual friends. Um, fortunate enough to be working with uh, with the same kind of podcast, I guess, management and, and co- company. Um, and we just got along super well straight away. And um, I remember I spoke with Robbie Ball, who's a, a guest of the show, and he'd, he'd had you on his show, and he just mentioned that it was such a good conversation. And um, obviously I've been buddy hearing your voice for that many years now that it was uh, when I met you, it was almost like I'd, I'd met you before. It's funny, DK, um, and, and people outside of Melbourne will be like, who's your guest, who's this random? But, like, yeah, in Melbourne, some people will know me off the radio from the days on Fox FM and now I'm at Kiss FM and I've got my own podcast, Byron Cook Show, get around it. Yeah, we'll um, have all the links to that in the show notes. Thank well. you. We'll touch on it again at some point today too, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not here for the plug. And he's out. Oh, he's off, guys. He's See gone. Yeah. There we go. Got, got what I needed. Bye. Uh, no, but it's funny when you, when you are primarily a radio personality uh, and then people meet you. Because what does a voice sound like? Like right now, people who don't know what I look like, I don't know, what are they imagining? Mm. You know what, I think that all the time when I'm in the car or whatever, you hear someone's voice every day and you do start thinking to yourself, I wonder what they actually look like. Because you start to piece, you try and think about, you match a few together and then, and then often when you do eventually see what they look like, it's nothing like you thought no, it was going to be. And I'm not sure, I mean, there's sort of backhanded compliments. Like, like, these are the ones I get quite a bit. <laughs> You're a lot taller than you sound. I don't know, what is a, what is a tall, I don't, do I sound like a short person? Which is fine too, I don't mind, short people are great. Then the other one I get a bit of is, um, you look younger than you sound. Well, I don't want to sound old. So that, that's also, right. in a way, that's an insult because I, I'm So you sound to, old and short? Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm tall and very fresh and very young, as you know. <laughs> yes. So it's, it's, look, it's, it's a weird thing, the world of radio and podcasting, although I guess, you know, with podcasting now, we've got the video cameras pointed at us. There we are. There's one right there. Yeah, the professional set up in here. So I guess there's not as much mystery as there once was. But yeah, back mm. in the day, no one knew what you looked like. When you first started out, was that... You know, I'd imagine, you know, because you start to build up a bit of a profile and a name and obviously being on the radio, everyone knows the name at least. Was it weird, like, being probably so known to so many people, particularly around Melbourne, the voice anyway, but then being able to kind of go out in public and almost, like, I'm assuming early days as well, go out in public and just be the same as everyone else. Like, no one even... Totally. Maybe, maybe someone heard you talking in, in the supermarket aisle, they'd come around the corner and go, hang on. That's basically all that would happen. I mean, uh, places like at Customs at the airport, only ever in Melbourne. Again, anyone outside of Melbourne's like, this, I don't know who you're talking about. But, but in Melbourne, so if you're at the airport, um, you might just start talking and they'd be like, ah, oh, right. <laughs> because also, um, my full name is Gregory Byron Cook. And right. I hated the first name so much that I insisted, I said to my parents when I got to about 18, nah. We're gonna we're gonna lose Greg. I'm yeah. over it. I'm, I'm, and I said to my girlfriend at the time, "You're not even gonna call me Greg." Right. Like, I just made a decision. What if was I, it about Greg that just didn't? It's just a very sort of seventies Brady bunch kind of name. Right. It's not right. cool at all. Yeah, okay. I mean, no disrespect to any Gregs yeah. listening. Uh, works <laughs> Shout for out you to all the Gregs. Greg, the, the, to the Greg listening right now, I say. You do you, boo. <laughs> but for me, it doesn't work, right? Um, so anyway, you'd be at customs and say so your passport says Gregory Byron Cook. Mm. So it's already, you're already sort of a bit low key. Yeah, yeah. But then you'd start talking, oh, Gregory Byron. Oh, but you're the guy off the radio. Yeah, I recognise right. your voice, but not, 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 not many people recognise your face. What was the... Like, what was the catalyst for you getting into radio and speaking publicly and stuff? Is it something like in school where you're a good public speaker or was it something that just naturally happened or how did that all come about? It's interesting. I think you should surround yourself with people who are willing to remind you of your strengths. Mm. I think that's really important. And and for me, I was really fortunate. Um, I was a bit of a late bloomer in high school. It took a while to get my confidence up. I probably only really hit my stride sort of late in year 11, year 12, yep. and eventually people worked out, this guy can speak. And um, I wasn't a prefect or Mr. Popular by any means. I, I didn't have any girlfriends. I struggled in high school, actually, but, yeah. you know, in, in a lot of ways, but probably just hit my stride towards the end and people realised I could speak. And, and the, the headmaster asked me to speak at our year 12 dinner. 
And so right. I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I had no right to, but I was just a geek <laughs> from nowhere. And I managed to speak there and, and did very well. And then when I got into university, I did a business degree. I didn't really think about a career in radio or media, but mm-hmm. I was in a business degree. And I'd always blitz it in anything that had to do with presentation. Right. So on the theory stuff, I would struggle a little bit, passes, fails, um, the odd credit. But anything that involved a presentation in front of people or being creative, you know, maybe make some video content yep. to make the presentation pop, add a bit of humour, yep. um, I would fly. I'd get high distinctions. And I remember a lecturer took me aside, a guy called Glenn Pierce uh, at the University of Western Sydney. Great guy, Glenn. And he said, mate, why are you even doing this course? You should be an entertainer. Good on you, Glenn, because he planted that seed. Yeah. Someone around me believed. Believe from someone else. And, yeah. and it, it, when it comes from <laughs> someone else, I know it should all be, oh, it's all about you. It comes from yourself. And mm. yes, it should. Yeah. But when someone is positive enough and supportive enough to take the time to go, that's a skill that you have. You need to pursue that. Mm. And from there, I really pursued it. So, so I think have a look around in, in your in your friendship group and in your in your professional group and, and just make sure that you've got people around you that do want the best for you mm. and if they notice something they just want to help you and, and I think that's really important. So that's what made me realise I should get into it was was probably validation from someone else. And you feel good on camera as well, obviously, because it's funny. I always think about that, like for people on radio or something, like someone that's big in podcasting and stuff like that. I'll, obviously, now with podcasting, a lot of it is now vi- visual as well for clips on socials and whatnot. But w- was the video side of things something that come naturally as well? Or was it more so you just kind of speaking, not worrying about uh, the appearance side of thing and just, just kind of having a chat? It's been pretty cool because I've got a good relationship with the folks at Channel 7 in 7 Sport. Mm-hmm. And... What was really great working with Seven was I never had any experience as a host reading an auto cue, you know, a game show host or a newsreader or whatever. I was just a radio guy that would just talk shit. Yeah. So if you're in a situation on Seven where you had to ad lib, as a radio person, that's all we do. Yeah. We just ad lib. So mm-hmm. the TV producers are like, how did you do that? What, yeah. you, you, you don't have an auto cue? It's like, well, mm. I've never – in radio, do, not, yeah. we, we just talk. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm not saying I'm – nailing the tv world but i don't find it particularly difficult because radio people tend to ad lib particularly yeah. fm radio people if you're a newsreader or something that's more scripted yeah but if you're just some well, you've free- done the hours and hours and hours of of practice so you think nothing of it it got to a point where um on channel seven during the melbourne cup carnival before they actually lost the rights to the melbourne cup carnival and went over to, to 10 but but they would throw everything at the melbourne cup carnival mm. on seven they, they had so much money and resources they even gave me a job like yeah. they, they would just put it <laughs> giving anyone a crack and so they sent me in there and they basically pointed a camera at me and said you know roaming brian the thing we do on the footy i'm like yeah they said you're going to do roaming byron and you're just going <laughs> to roam around the bird cage yeah. we're going to point a camera at you and you're just going to start talking to people freestyle and I didn't find it particularly difficult. No. I'm not saying I'm, I'm uh, Brian Taylor. Yeah. I mean, uh, he's the goat. Yeah. I'm a very cheap <laughs> imitation of Brian Taylor. But I didn't find that hard. And they were very happy. They had to edit a fair bit of it together. But they were like, well, that was easy, wasn't it? I'm like, yeah, because we just talk. That's what we do. It's funny how it evolves, isn't it? So when I first start, and I'm obviously in comparison to someone like yourself, not even on a similar level, but when I first started the podcast, so I started – relatively early for podcasting stages really it was like 2016 I think and I remember the episodes were quite short I would have the whole script written in my notes on my phone I'd sit there try and make it not sound like I was reading a fucking novel and I wasn't that good at reading either so right. it was even worse <laughs> right. Right? So going, uh, by the way guys have a listen to those early episodes yeah. <laughs> I'm going who the fuck wrote that oh wow. that was me yeah. yeah anyway so that went on for a while and then it's funny just again just the practice like over time it evolved to the point where now, like, I'm so comfortable with it. Like, I'll even when I record by myself, like, I'll get a question from someone on social media or whatever, and I'll go, All right, I'm going to do an episode on this. And it, even as it evolved, like, through the middle stages, I would have, like, so many dot points written down so I could at least come back to what I wanted to touch on. Whereas now I'll hit record with absolutely fucking no idea what I'm going to talk about. Great. And just roll through it and, it. and I find it so much more comfortable. And then it's translated onto the camera stuff as well, even just with social media and stuff like that, just through practice. But... Um, but as you said before, in the end of the day, like once you get to the point where you're comfortable, it really is, we're just having a conversation. So whereas at the start, I would, I would hype it up in my brain thinking, all right, this is an interview. This is like a back and forth. It needs to be perfect. Whereas now it's like, if I was talking to you right now without the microphone and the camera, 
there's absolutely zero difference in what we're doing right now. It's just the fact that everyone gets to enjoy the conversation as well. And I'll tell you a guideline, and you've absolutely nailed that, a guideline I've always used on radio. Um, one of my pet peeves on radio, and to, you'll never hear me do this, right? I hate when on radio, and I've often had scripts in front of me at different radio sessions I've worked at, right, that go, mm. G'day, Melbourne, it's Byron here. No, no, I'm not talking to fucking Melbourne. I'm yeah. talking to the one person in the car listening to me, right? Yeah. And just with your podcast, you're talking to that one person right now. So the person right now in their car listening to this, you're the only person we're talking to. Mm. Forget that we're talking to anyone else. The intimacy of a radio broadcast or a podcast is that it's one-on-one communication. So one of the things I used to do as a little hack when I first started just doing music shifts on top 40 radio stations, I would get uh, my phone out and I would just have a picture of someone. It might be my only mate, Trent Wheeler, who's my mate up in Sydney. We <laughs> joke that he's my only friend. Um, and I would talk into the microphone but look at the picture of Trent and I would talk as if I'm talking to him. To him. And so it was the difference between saying, hey, it's 101.9 The Fox, this is Byron here. I'm going to play you a track coming up from the weekend. Now, I'm telling Trent that I'm going to play him a track. Yeah. Right? Instead of thinking I'm in this big studio, hey, Melbourne, i got some hits for you coming up. It's like suddenly you're not a human. You are a a robotic promotional vehicle. It's not relatable to the audience. Be a person, right? And so podcasting, the reason I think it's exploded, and credit to you for being one of the OGs of podcasting and and to have the discipline week in, week out, 350-something episodes in, that is unbelievable, man. But I think the reason podcasts like this are successful is you have a personal connection with your audience Mm. you're offering something whether it's useful information entertainment advice it's very intimate yeah this shit is intimate and 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 that's why podcasting will never not be huge because people want that intimacy they want to be friends the people who listen to you um that one person right now listening to you they know you yeah even if they've never met you i find big uh similarities between podcasting and vlogging on youtube like the personal vlogs where where they're speaking to the camera in more so than your social media posts where someone can have a huge following but their audience really doesn't have any clue of who this person is they know what they look like and what their their image their edited images look like but youtube vlogs like uh, before i got into podcasting I, i used to watch like a handful of youtube vlogs just religiously and, you know, I met a few of them in person a few years down the track and it really is like you already know them. Like, obviously, they have fucking no idea who you are. Yeah. But you walk up and, and because you have seen, like, their actual personality and, it fe- again, it feels like they're talking to you, you build this connection. And that's why I think big YouTubers and podcasters, but particularly YouTubers, have almost like a cult following. You know yes. what I mean? Like, anything they do just blooms. And the more open you are and the more honest you are, the more people will resonate and connect with you. I found in the early days working with Fifi Box, right back on the Triple M shebang, which is one of the first big radio gigs I ever had, Fifi was utterly and completely unedited. You did not know what she was going to say. She would share so much stuff. She yeah. was an absolute open book. And we would go to events and listeners, literally random listeners that had never met her, I remember once they were grabbing her phone trying to ring this boyfriend called the Landscaper. They're like, we've got to get your phone, let's call the Landscaper. It's like you've never met this person and you're snatching her phone off her at an event. <laughs> but they felt like they could because yeah. she, was, she would share these vulnerable, crazy tales about these ridiculous ex-boyfriends. Mm. And, and it was so intimate that people felt like they completely overstepped the mark in terms of the social cues, but no one cared because... That's kind of what we sign up for when yeah. we do radio. Yeah. If we want almost inviting it, yeah. yeah. And 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 what I found in the evolution of the Byron Cook show, I wanted initially for the show to be this sort of harder edged talk topics, almost ABC radio style. Let's hit the big hard topics, ones I could never do on Fox FM, and let's go down that road. What I found is not that downloads is the only KPI mm. for a show, yeah. but in terms of interest in the show, the more personal and blatantly just raw I can be the more people want to listen to it. Yeah. So now I've realised, yes, I still want to make a difference and talk about important subjects, but how can I twist that and show a vulnerability in every episode rather than being effectively the host of the 7.30 report, yeah. asking lots of questions, being the impartial, so, Mr Prime Minister, no, every episode now I've realised I've got to be raw. I've yeah. got to own it. Like the one I've just dropped, first episode of the year. I'm being honest. Mm. I'm going to get the snip. I've had it. I'm yeah. done. I've got a great son. Yeah. Um, this 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 um, 
confusion around whether or not I ever want to have kids again has affected my personal life. It's affected relationships. I've not deliberately, but I've had two relationships with girls significantly younger than me. And a lot of the difficulties have been around life stage. Yeah. So eliminate that. Let's take that off the table. Yeah. That way, any future partner, I ain't reversing it, by the way. Yeah. Apparently, it's quite <laughs> painful. So, any future partner then knows the score. Yeah. So, instead of doing a show about vasectomies, yeah. where I don't <laughs> reveal anything about myself, hey, let's talk about vasectomies. Hey, I'm going to go get the snip. Let's take the show into Dr. Snip's surgical. I mean, sorry, it's, it's yeah, going yeah, no, to get graphic. Yeah, it's yeah. going to get graphic. <laughs> if you want go to come along, it. let me know. <laughs> Find a personal twist, make it intimate, and, 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 Try and have no filter if, mm. if possible. This is good stuff. So this is kind of exactly what I was, what I was kind of hoping to touch on uh, early in this chat anyway. So in regards to effective communication, so kind of like you were saying before, I, I try and do very similar stuff now, like whether it's recording an episode at home and, you know, Russ, my, my puppy, every single time I decide to get on the phone, record a podcast or record a voice message, he decides it's time to either <laughs> sing or play with all these fucking toys. <laughs> right. All right. So he comes in and it'll be mid episode and, in the past, I would have gone, oh, fuck, got to start again, press stop, tell him to get the fuck out, and then go again. Whereas now, I'll just start talking to him in the episode. Or yeah, that's the goal. There was, a, there was once an episode in Vegas where I'd already had a few, and I was like, fuck, I'm going to do an episode. So I'd, I'd ordered a cocktail, which I'd forgotten about, and I was in my room, and the maid brings it up and, and comes in. So I just kept the episode going and said, thanks so much, and sat down and finished my cocktail in the episode. But in terms of that effective communication, like, even outside of podcasting and radio, like is what are some of like I guess the biggest lessons you've learnt in regards to how you're able to get your message to the the target audience? So like a lot of people listen to this show who are either business owners, produce a lot of content for their business on social media, um, or are just either trying to sell something or just trying to to get their message or or their their business out there in a way of communicating. So like, what are some of the key takeaways or, or something that you can kind of give the listeners? I keep going. Or give the listener who is sitting in his car that we're talking to right now. We'll edit that yeah. bit out where we talked over each other because we want a perfect podcast. So I'm sure you will you'll clean that right up. You know what? Let's start again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, that, that's ruined everything. No, um, I keep coming back to that original show I did. That show called the Shebang, which was an afternoon drive show, mm-hmm. and uh, had Fifi Box, Marty Sheargold. We had a number of other comedians for a while there. We had a huge ensemble cast, and my only background up until anchoring this huge national show on Triple M was I'd done music stuff you know yep. that was ACDC and coming up as Nickelback you know that was better yeah. that's, that's yeah. really all I had to offer and so suddenly they're like no this guy seems to know what he's doing we think he has the ability to effectively be the orchestra conductor and conduct this show right and you had comedians Joe Stanley was there another Adelaide comedian called Jody J Hill we had a guy Mikey Robbins who's a Sydney based comedian we had all sorts of people come in on that show Marty Fifi at times and sometimes then guests would come in on top of your four or five co-hosts it was just this thing this idea they had that we'd have this huge round table of comedians so i'm in melbourne on this war relic podcast it was the old eon fm podcast uh sorry uh i'm so used to saying podcast panel it was the old it was the old eon fm panel right it was it was it was a piece of shit (laughs) it didn't work and i've got faders with comedians in adelaide and melbourne and sydney and then i've got a couple in front of me and i've got screens everywhere and i'm like well how the hell is this going to work yeah But the executive producer at the time, a guy called Brad Hume, who was a great radio brain, I'll never forget, and this advice goes for communication just generally. He Mm -hmm. said, Byron, the most important thing you can do as an anchor, and I know this is going to be overwhelming, you've got five comedians all trying to be funnier than each other, they're going to be talking over each other, they're all in different cities, there's Mm -hmm. going to be bits of delay, it's going to be a nightmare. Listen. Just fucking listen Mm -hmm. to them. And he also said, As the anchor, you are the person in the car trying to make sense of what the hell is going on. So if you're really listening to them, if something doesn't make sense to you and you're really actually listening to them instead of thinking of the next hilarious thing you're going to say, you effectively play the role of translator because you're in the car with the person listening and you go, Marty, sorry, I'll pick you up on something you said there. You said, did you do a milk run in Canberra? Did you? Were you a milko? Or whatever, because he yeah. might assume everyone knew he was yeah. a Milko. Yeah. So listening is so important in life. We miss the gold if we don't 
listen. If we're so busy worrying about the next thing, and it comes down to something as simple as a greeting at a party, if you're so busy in your head thinking about how you're going to introduce yourself, you don't listen to them telling you their name. Yeah. So you actually forget their name because yeah. you were so busy thinking, oh, how am I going to impress this girl with my hilarious intro? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, I forgot your name because I was too busy thinking of how I was going to say my name. Yeah. <laughs> so listening is really important and I think it's the first step in communication. We have all these drills around how yeah. to outwardly communicate. I think it's the listening part that is critical. Yeah, well, we've got two ears and, and one mouth for a reason, right? So... And that's something that I've found and some bits that I've grabbed from, you know, courses and, and educational stuff around content and marketing over the, over, over the years is how important it is even just, for example, through social media or an email list is actually listening to your audience. And that's how I create all of my content is I'll have, you know, Jane Doe send me a message on Instagram saying, oh, uh, I've been getting a sore back with when I do barbell back squats um, like what what should I do to fix it so I'll screenshot it and then use her question as a as a full piece of content and because you know that other people want to know the same thing which is super interesting in terms of before we move on I want to I want to touch around on some some productivity stuff because I know you know even today your schedule is just fucked and you know you it's, need pretty to, fucked, yeah, it's pretty I, fucked I'll tell you what if you were a productivity expert you've come to the wrong guy yeah, like okay. I don't know if I'm <laughs> the poster child for productivity but but please go I know we've spoke about, you know, being super vulnerable and just kind of being yourself and whatnot, but there are still days and times where you need to get shit done and you need to kind of get on with it. So how, I'm assuming there's been plenty of mornings or afternoons or whatever where you've gone in to record a podcast or you've been on radio and you've been in a horrendous mood or something outside of work is kind of really distracting and, and it's very hard to concentrate. Like, what are some of the tools that you use to be able to just get on with it and block all that stuff out to be able to actually focus on the job at hand and not let outside distractions take over your your bandwidth. Well, I'll come at it from a slightly different angle. Think about the sort of setup that you have and don't leave yourself too vulnerable. And let me explain that. When I had a group of people that were relying on me to be at Fox FM in South Melbourne at quarter past five and you knew if you weren't there, you would let the team down, you just showed up. When it's you reporting to yourself, yeah. sometimes, man, that's, that's a real test. So I think the first thing is make sure you're in a group where you know I don't want to let this group down. That's Accountability. My, it's my duty. I have to be there. So even if you've had a shocking – I remember working at Triple M in Sydney, one of the worst days of my life, like literally at my marriage literally had fallen apart that morning. Literally, I had had to say to my now ex-wife, who is now a, a good friend of mine, we co-parent my son Zephyr, who lives in America, she's American. I remember I had, I had to ask her, she was in the car heading to LAX to fly to Sydney, and we won't go into the detail, but I'm, I remember having to say, you need to turn the car around. Don't come. And that morning I had to do a breakfast radio show. Straight after. And in a way, it was therapy. So also... Surround yourself with a team who have a good energy because those guys, that was the Triple M Grill team at the time, and those guys are just good energy, good vibes, and I saw them as a way to escape. And and so I didn't want to let them down. I had to turn up, and also they were just a great vibe and they actually lifted my energy so that the energy of the people around you is really important. Really important, yeah. To to help overcome that because no one necessarily wants to hear a bloke who's really depressed who's just his marriage has fallen apart when they're heading off to their day plumbing or being a receptionist at at an office. Mm. You do sometimes, I know I talk about be authentic and I think podcasting allows you to be more authentic and and that's part of the love-hate I have with commercial radio. Right. Is it's not really, you, you know, common to share if you're having a shocking day. So there radio. is a bit of that sort of the tears of a clown kind mm. of vibe, yeah. you know. It's yeah. um, the forced smile. I'm really happy when, in yeah. fact, my life's falling apart. So <laughs> there are challenges with it, but a, a lot of it, I believe, comes down to the people around you and, and yeah, your responsibilities to those people. Yeah, that's super interesting. In terms of, like, your you – know, 
in terms of like what the con- the stuff you're doing at the moment. So obviously the Byron Cook show, um, you're back on radio. I don't know is this week for sure. How many? How how long are you going to be back on radio for now? Look, I, I'm I'm hanging out uh, helping out Kiss 101 in Melbourne, their breakfast show. They, yep. They've got a lot happening with the team. Um, the, the the main guy Jace, who's a legend. Um, the third baby's on the way. There's yep. just a lot going on, and there were some COVID issues with some yep. of the staff. So so they just decided, hey, let's just keep it clean. Throw Byron in, mm-hmm. and then their show will come back sometime in mid. Feb, so I'll be yeah. there for about a month. Awesome, and then I, I'll probably kick around Kiss somewhere because they're good. They're good people, yeah. and I, I'm enjoying being there. So yeah, I'll probably... I've, actually, I've met Jace a few times. We did a few um, a few events with Keep It Clean. We ran some big workouts. Um, can't remember what they called the the actual event, but we had it was about four or five hundred people there at one of them, um, just over the timber yard across the road. Actually. Oh, great! Yeah, yeah great. He's, he's a real good guy. He's a, he's, a good guy. he's a legend. So yeah, so so uh, so to to answer your question, yeah, I'll be doing that maybe for you know another month, and then I'll probably I'll probably kick around there for a while. Unreal. What are some of the things that you do to start your day? Like I'm a big believer in, in having, and you may not have any form of set routine or anything like that, but I'm sure there's some things that kind of bring you back to feeling good or, or whatever. So, you know, I start my day the same way every day if possible, like even whether I've got work or whether I'm just doing nothing, you know, be my morning routine. And that sets me up for even particularly mentally to be in the right headspace for the day ahead. So are there any little things that you like to do every single day or maybe before you jump on radio or the podcast to get yourself up and about? The FM radio stuff, and my team would always laugh at it, but uh, and I don't know, you, the jury's probably out on how effective it is, and you're the guru, the guru on this stuff, but I was doing the bulletproof diet, right? bulletproof coffees. And I found, for those who aren't familiar, you're effectively mixing a nice strong black coffee with some butter and some MCT oil, and uh, it worked for me. That, that was yeah. just a habitual thing that yeah. I would do, and they'd be like, what's this weird thing you're drinking? But <laughs> it, 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 it worked for me. Yeah. Um, there was one dude, this is not me, but one dude, Craig Ennis, I believe his name was, up on the Central Coast. He would famously, in his car, he would park his car before he did a breakfast radio show up there, and he would meditate in his car right. for 20 minutes before the show yep. started. I mean, I'd rather him just in with the rest of the team brainstorming ideas, but okay, not just happy, <laughs> happy meditation, bro. <laughs> So, so everyone's different, but for me, as long as – I mean, this is probably not out of the textbook of how to do it, but, but as long as I have, you know, a nice energy hit, yep. um, that's enough for me. And then from there, it's like with what I do, if it's live radio, for example, there is an adrenaline rush no matter how long you've done it. When the on-air light's flashing mm. and you're good to go, there is an adrenaline rush and you can't help but – be awake and ready to go and you have to lock in and uh yeah it's sort of it's almost an inbuilt energy but that's easy for a job like that i'm sure if you have a different type of job where there isn't a flashing light and uh and that sort of energy it might be more difficult and i I, you know i'm probably not the guy to help someone in that situation yeah on well on the topic of energy um in, in terms of health and fitness um what are some of the things, you know, obviously this, this, this show called the Fitness and Lifestyle Podcast, like what are some of the things that you found over the years that have really kind of, you've enjoyed in, I guess, the health and fitness space in terms of staying on top of your health, which obviously then leads to, to better productivity and sleep and, and all the rest of it as well? Yeah, I, I think everyone's different again. I am not the F45, I want to train until I'm vomiting guy. Mm-hmm. I'm just not that guy. Yeah. I get that some people just love that stuff. For me, I've always believed whether it's diet or exercise, my mantra has been do something that you can see yourself doing forever. That's yep. been my yeah, mantra. And I've, heard you, say this, I've yep. heard you say the same very thing. Similar. So for me, I enjoy maintenance. I enjoy three to four workouts a week, two to three maybe, depends yep. on the week. COVID was tough. You know, I couldn't do my lap pull downs. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I like just the, the consistency of showing up. Yep. I'm also a believer, again, some PT that wants to like drive you into the ground probably wouldn't agree with this. I think you're better off turning up and doing something than staying at home and not doing anything. Yep. So the idea that I'm at the gym now, so I have to go so hard that I vomit everywhere. No, just, just move. Mm. At least you've done something. Yep. Be happy you've done something. Yep. I know that sort of goes against some of the training mantra of push it, do that extra rep, you piece of shit. You know? But it's like, no, I'm, well, I'm at the gym. It's a start. Yeah. So, so I try and show up. And then I have consistency in routine. I know the things um, from a nutrition standpoint that don't make me feel very good. Yep. I've never had like tests from doctors or whatever, but I do have a very low Listen carb to your body. diet. Yep. Yeah, and uh, I know that when I'm having lots of lean protein, lots of veggies, staying hydrated, um, and rocking up to the gym probably three times a week, I'm feeling pretty good. When I don't do that, I'm not feeling so good. Yeah, it's funny the the communication side of things again. What you just touched on there. 
with the personal trainer, uh, that's something that I, that's took me a little while to learn as well, like early days with communicating with clients is actually, as you said, listening, listening to the client because in the end of the day, you don't need to be smashed every single time you come into the gym. That's, that's just not how it works. And, and for someone that's coming in paying a trainer or someone to be there and then the trainer just does it their way, the same way with every single client, like it, it's, it, that's an art and a skill in itself, I think, is starting to actually get to know the individual, get to know when to push and when to pull back, how to communicate with them in a way that's going to be effective. You know, coming from a sport background, you'd have the coaches where they just fucking drill everyone. And not everyone responds well to that. You know what I mean? Like some of the best coaches I find in the world who are obviously incredible communicators are people that can have a list of 15 different athletes and know exactly how to communicate with each and every single one of them to bring the best out of them. Yeah. I well, find that so intriguing. I'd imagine it's a balancing act for yourself, DK, because the extreme, of course, is I say to you, hey, at least I turned up, so what we're going to do today is we're going to sit in the corner like and not... fish. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, because at least I turned up. Yeah. And then on the other extreme, you obviously want gains, you mm. want results for your clients. Yeah. And so I'd imagine it's that fine balancing act of finding that middle ground where you're not pushing them so hard that they never want to see you again and they then hate exercise yeah. versus being allowed to just bludge and not do anything. Yeah. That's the grey area. That, that you're the expert with that. I just know that if if you were training me and you were busting my ass, I would cancel. Yeah, I just I don't <laughs> yeah, want. I don't yeah. like what I'm not. I'm not going in. What are those tournaments? Those what are they called? The bodybuilding shows. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I, that's not me. Like yeah. I'm not. So so I just want to stay fit and healthy. I guess it's about be, uh, being true to your goals and all that stuff. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I just think some people. I know people who are, are, are quite overweight quite significantly overweight and they go i'm going to hit the gym and they go straight to f45 it's like you're going from zero to 100 yeah, bro no what are you doing setting unrealistic goals and setting yourself up for failure right from day one yeah so yeah. I, I, I try and keep things realistic um i just like to just be generally healthy uh, and and that's sort of how i do it you just come back from from over, over in the states was it la where you were yeah, yeah you're yeah. in la yep yeah. got went over to see your son um, and and um, we were kind of going back and forth while you're over there, just in terms of some programming for the little little man. So how how old is he? So Zephyr Cook is his name. He's 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 a hell of a guy. Yeah. Uh, he's 13 now. He was born in Los Angeles, and I lived in Los Angeles with his mum. We were married, and we, we had him in LA, and that's where we thought life was going to be forever. Yeah. Really, um, you know, life has a habit of not quite you know, yeah. the script that you yeah, have yeah, yeah. can can change the script. Uh, anyway, um, we, we, I hadn't seen him in person i chat to him every day and video yeah. chat and we're, we're we're probably closer than most father and son but i hadn't physically seen him for two years uh because of the pandemic and i had uh travel exemption requests that were denied apparently right. the government if you say you're on some sort of business trip they'll let you go but if you say i'd like to see my son apparently that's not a valid reason so so you know cash is king yeah anyway um so i couldn't see him for two years I respected the rules, by the way. I didn't try and challenge them. I mean, COVID's been a mess. So, okay, we'll do what we have to do as as society. Anyway, uh, LA was where we met and um, it was great because we had neutral turf. It was um, his mother um, and his nana. His nana lives in Pasadena, California. And so we all stayed at his nana's house. So me, the ex-wife, Zephyr, nana, we're all together in the same house. They actually live in New Orleans. Okay. um, But they happened to be in LA at that time of the year. And I thought, well, this is nice. Um sort of middle ground yep. let's meet there so so we had a couple of weeks in LA um and it was so special because I hadn't seen my own son from from the age of 11 to 13 like I hadn't That's given crazy, him yeah. a cuddle for yeah. god's sake yeah so it was it was huge but yeah we, we had a lot of fun over there and, and I like to play half court hoops with him and and I thought and I actually messaged you about this I'm like at what age can you introduce a young person to a gym to resistance equipment yeah i felt like 13 felt about right so we did hit the gym and actually um i got zephyr to leave us a bit of a message for the dk fitness yes, podcast we'll run that now here we go hey dad uh hey danny it's zephyr um just calling here from new orleans or i guess sending a message here from new orleans um, so yeah, I, well, I was in LA with dad, um, you know, we did some training exercises at the gym in my grandma's apartment. Um, great gym, you know, I did lats and back, buys and tries, I did the cross trainer, uh, what else did I, I did chess, and I, I, you know, I learned some things about the different parts of my body, I learned, uh, that my lats and back were quite strong, and my legs were good on the on the cross trainer mainly because I travel and uh, walk a lot but um 
chest and um and buys and tries not not so much so uh yeah just take that into consideration and um be happy to learn some more exercising tips thanks guys I mean, he's he's the best. Like it was his first time in a gym, and I'm not a trainer. I'm not I'm not you, but just from doing it myself, I just tried to pass on some very yeah. general information, and um, he responded so well. So did did I go at the right time? Is thirteen okay? Yeah, this is a good question. So even when I first started, I think I started getting into the weights. It was about fifteen or sixteen around that around that age, um, and even then there was like a lot of uncertainty as to how early you should get in the gym and lift weights you know there's always talk of you know slowing down growth platelets and all this type of stuff in, in younger younger people but since I've learned so much more about the industry and, and how important and how effective their resistance and strength training can be not only physically but mentally because that's that's one of the biggest reasons why I do all the shit I do now is because I just went from being probably not that happy and not confident at all to being super confident and just seeing how incredible being in the gym and exercising actually made me feel. And I was already playing sport and stuff, but the gym was different. It was just like a sense of accomplishment. You go in there, you invest in yourself and, and you build up on confidence every time. So I think for someone who, who's quite young and I've found particularly working with athletes, early you can start getting kids to even, even without the resistance, without the weights, like doing movement patterns, which is so important as well, like actually teaching teaching younger kids male or female like how to actually move properly is so important and the other thing to keep in mind is that it's a skill so that it's like anything else the earlier you learn it and the, and the more you practice it the better you're going to be at it as the years go on so I think for the for the little man to be in there nice and early learning all these new skills and and is only going to help him down the track but as I said before it does absolute wonders for you mentally as well you know especially still being in school building up that confidence and the self-esteem is just extremely powerful and i felt that responsibility though because like in adult training i suppose you will have seen where clients tend to want to do less weight if possible and you're saying no why don't you stack on some more i think you could get some extra reps out here you could really get some extra gains here i think i I had to actually do the opposite was he he didn't realize that what he was doing could potentially put strain on him and so for example on the seated row you know, he's saying, no, nah, more weight, Dad, more weight, more weight. It's like, no, 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 no. we're going to go easy. Yeah. There's this thing's called DOMS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but he wanted to push. And, and so I felt like I sort of wished you were there because I, I, I found myself as a trainer asking him to do less. Do less, yeah. But I felt like it was the right thing. I'm like, no, Z-Man, let's just chill. I, I just want you to just get used to this. Mm. I know you think you can do more weight. I'm sure you can, but let's just go easy. Same with the cross trainer. Like I put some Instagram stories of him going probably way too hard on the cross trainer <laughs> and had a few people going, why are you doing that to him? It's like, no, he, he, he was to, going yeah. that hard. Yeah. Do you have to sort of be careful that their, their youthful exuberance doesn't get, they don't get ahead of themselves and hurt themselves? Mm. Well, well, coming back to what I said before, it's a skill. So it's learning, learning moving patterns and skills. So uh, I was on a podcast yesterday um, with the girls from Keep It Clean and we touched on this and it wasn't specifically... Oh, they're great. They're great. Incredible, yeah. It wasn't specifically around kids but it was more so around you know if you've had some time off training or you've been injured or, or you just haven't been in the gym for a long time like getting back in there but you've previously done it before and you know someone like a kid who wants to to go quite nuts and, and just go ham in there you almost need to take that that step backwards initially and just work your way into it because I, I always say when you're first starting out or if you're just coming back from a long layoff you're much better off finishing the first few weeks feeling like you could have done a little bit more but getting a bit of a taste of it and laying down the foundations to then add on earlier on, uh, later on, sorry. Yeah, yeah. If you go out too hard too soon, then that's when you start to get issues. And I think particularly with kids as well because that's what I was like. I went in there and just was an absolute fucking nut job. Like I'd go in there five (laughs) days a week just fucking ruin myself right. right and now i'm already i'm starting to suffer from like from some of some of that uh stuff now so i think gradually building into it and finishing the session knowing that you could probably could have done this a little bit more once you've laid down that foundation and you start to get a bit more confident and and the movement's better that's when you can start to to load up a little bit well away from zef as a 13 year old i i can relate to what you were saying because i saw, we saw a lot of that in lockdown especially living in melbourne where we had about 17 lockdowns and some of them were longer than others yeah. but there was one they all you, you lose track of time of how many fucking lockdowns we had oh, but there was one of them that was really long towards the start yeah. and it's when the gyms first shut for quite a significant amount of time i remember i went back to the gym i was training at in south melbourne and i've gone to the leg press i just do the machine leg press yeah. and i just went about the leg press the way i used to go about the leg press and i reckon I haven't done it for three months and I'd already finished I think two sets and one of the trainers came across and went oh you're doing 
way less than you normally do, right? I'm like, no. Yeah, you should know, okay, uh, this could be an issue for you. Yeah. The next day I had that waddle. That, you know that you, where you waddle? Couldn't sit on the toilet. I couldn't sit on the toilet yeah. and, and my legs wouldn't bend. Yeah. And I, I put an Insta story of myself trying to walk and it was... It was Walking p- on stilts. It was pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you, I guess yeah, yeah. everyone's got to be mindful of these things. Yeah, and that's the thing because there's, there's two more things I'll kind of touch on there um, before we get <clears throat> a bit closer to wrapping up there. Um because there is the danger, and this is where this is what I fell into. And again, this is again why I share my story: is that you do start to see the results, you do start to push yourself pretty hard, but then all of a sudden it becomes it can very quickly become like an obsession, and you get too too into it to the point where it consumes you to the point where it's unhealthy. It's see, pretty that's ironic. You. Right? See, I've never been that guy. It's pretty ironic, but, I, that, but for kids in particular, yeah. that, that I see that a lot of the time. Good now. point. Even good point. Some clients have got now their son. Is a is a really good uh, athlete, and you know he he's kind of at the borderline now where he's probably doing too much. But he's, and this is what was in my mind. I was like, all right, well, fuck, I'm just going to work harder than everyone else. That's right. That's, that's, that's how I'm going to win. I might not be a skill, but I'm going to win. You're like LeBron James, strive for greatness, and you're probably like twelve or something. <laughs> yeah. that's, that, that's, so you just went too far, mate. Too too hard, too early. So just just gradually working your way into it. But at the same time, as I said before, for parents listening that have kids that are wanting to get into it encourage them to do it because like I said like the the benefits that they will see not only in obviously their physical and mental health but in all areas and I find this now whenever I'm in good structure and routine with my training and my food everything flourishes like my the podcasting increases like the the productivity with work increases it makes you want to actually get better sleep and and hydrate more and it just kind of goes across the board so I think it's an incredibly positive thing to, to get into it at an early age. Awesome, mate. No, well, 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 then we're doing the right thing. And I'll work with you um, as far as a program where I can train him a bit sort of Zoom style, the way a lot mm. of people trained in lockdown. I thought maybe just once a week. We probably have video calls three or four times a week and yeah, then we have cool. WhatsApp messages every hour. But maybe one of those weekly video calls could be a little bit of a sesh where I just yeah, yeah. In- interact with Start him. Start educating. Much like a lot of us did in our homes during lockdown with our trainers, I could yep. do something like that. Now, I'm not. I'm, I'm a pretty lame trainer, but I'm free. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But if you can give me a program, um, I might do something like that with him. 100%. Well, Byron, mate, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show and I'd love to get you on again at some point. Um, I've definitely learnt a, a lot from our conversation, particularly around the communication side of things, which is uh, which is awesome. And I'm sure the audience is absolutely bloody froth listening to it. So I appreciate you coming on, mate. I can't believe I didn't teach you about the fitness stuff. That's just so hurtful to me. I mean, yeah, surely well, my wisdom in the... Yeah. No, no, you, <laughs> mate, you, you're an absolute goat of podcasting and I'm, I'm stoked to be on the show. And I'd love to have you on the Byron Cook Show. Um, we've got a new format this year. It's Lusa. I've got a co-host, DJ Perry Lee. I've got a producer, Needy Jack. Uh, there's a whole bunch of us. He's Incredible. very, very needy. Very needy. Um, <laughs> he'll send you lots of messages. You know, how was my performance? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'd love you on as well, mate, because yeah, uh, sure. we've got lots to learn from you. Incredible. All right, guys, thanks so much for tuning in to the show. Make sure you go and uh, subscribe to the Byron Cook Show. Um, plenty of awesome content on there and you can hear more of this great man's voice Uh, but if you've enjoyed today's episode which I'm sure you have we'd love for you to take a screenshot and post it up on Instagram story tag myself tag Byron his his Instagram handle and all the links to his show and whatnot will be in the show notes and we'd love to hear your feedback so appreciate you guys tuning in and enjoy the rest of your day see ya